Welcome to the Heart of Dad podcast. Heart of Dad is a podcast for entrepreneurs who are passionate about their families and business and looking to find more clarity, more balance and more alignment in all areas of their life. Come and join the community at heartofdad.com or on Facebook at groups forward slash heart of dad. This week on Heart of Dad, I'm interviewing Dickin Bettinger. Dickin Bettinger, Ed D, received his doctorate in counselling psychology and practised as a licensed clinical psychologist. Dickin's whole career, 44 years, has focused on psychological well-being. He co-founded a training, counselling and education centre in Vermont. And Dickin was a senior staff member at Pranskin Associates in Laconnor, Washington for 16 years, where he developed and led corporate and university leadership trainings, team development and executive coaching. In 2012, Dickon founded his own business called Three Principles Mentoring. He offers four-day immersion retreats for individuals and couples and offers development for Three Principles practitioners. He enjoys leading group seminars in the US and throughout Europe. Dickon is the co-author of a book called Coming Home, Uncovering the Foundations of Psychological Wellbeing. Dickon has been happily married for 50 years. He has two adult children and four adored grandchildren. He enjoys photography, hiking, canoeing and travelling. So this week on Heart of Dad, I'm really delighted to be introducing Dr. Dickin Bettinger. Uh, Dickin has been um, a massive, uh, has played a massive part in my life in the last, last nine months as a, as a mentor, as a coach, as a teacher, to help me deepen my understanding of um, how life works, how I work in life. And um, a big part of our discussions has been fatherhood. And Dickon has very kindly agreed to come onto the show to, to, to explore that with me today. So welcome, Dickon. It's great to have you here. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Good to be here. So for, for those um, who don't know you, Dickon, would you mind just introducing yourself a little bit and telling us who you are? Uh, first and foremost, father of two amazing kids and... Each of my kids are grown now, and and they have, and they have two kids. Uh, so I have four grandkids now. Uh, I've been married fifty years. So, uh, and my grandkids are now fourteen, fifteen, eleven, three, and four months. So I'm also very happy about being a grandfather something about the grand part it's a grand affair let me tell you it's been it's been the greatest and to be able to watch my own kids uh have their kids and watch them parent and see how the ways in which i parented my kids really did rub off uh and they're now wonderful parents. So uh, uh, I became a psychologist over 40 years ago. I actually started my career working with high school kids. I was a high school teacher. Uh, I had so many kids coming to me to talk about their problems that I got in t- passionately curious about Uh, what can I share with kids that would make their difficult times easier? And so that began my passion for learning about what helps people have an easier time in life. As a psychologist, my whole career, I focused on well-being. Uh, I didn't see people as having illnesses, mental illnesses. I saw people as uh, normal, ordinary people who at times, like all of us, struggle. And so I got my doctorate in education in counseling psychology. And the education philosophy was if somebody is having a difficult time, it's not their fault, number one. Number two, The only problem is they just haven't learned what they need to learn to have an easier time of it. So that makes all of us students. So I've continued to be a student my whole life. And uh, 
it sure is fun learning more and more about well-being and and that certainly influences uh everything that i'll be talking about today fantastic thank you um, so so you know the the community we're, we're both part of and you're you know obviously a leading figure in is is called the three principles and in, in our work together we've been kind of exploring um the nature of experience and uh you know one of the things that i've regularly brought to you have been some of my challenges around around being a dad and you've been very open about your own journey in that and i wondered whether you might share kind of a bit of a before and after picture um thinking of how life was for you as a parent before you came more deeply into the three principles understanding and how, how it changed for you after uh <laughs> <laughs> feels feels like another lifetime now, but uh, uh, I, I did a lot of thinking. I was in my head. I had a big heart, but I was in my head all the time. So if, if you're in your head all the time, it covers up that heart. And so I love my kids, but I was intensely preoccupied with my life, my work. I thought that I had to think about my life in order to develop and get better. I was deeply uh, committed to the notion of if you want to develop yourself as a human being, you have to work really hard at it. Uh, so I was constantly uh, working on myself. So what that looked like was four hours of meditation a day. I was doing, uh, I was remembering five dreams a night. I trained myself to wake up at the end of REM sleep. I was recording them in full length and working on them all the next day. I had affirmation notebooks. I had cognitive notebooks where I'd write down my thinking and reframe it. I had structured journals, I had unstructured journals, and I read at least three self-development books a week. So that gives you some idea that if I'm doing all of those things that I'm pretty occupied, plus I was working full time. Um, my kids called me Space Cadet. One time when my daughter was 13, my son was probably eight. They're in the back seat of the car, my wife's in the front seat. When I got in the car, I didn't know they had already taken bets on how far past the store I would drive. And I didn't disappoint them. I drove across town, went right past the store, went out into the country, kept driving all the way to the next town. My daughter burst out laughing and said, Dad, you are such a space cadet. Where were we going? And I went, oh my God, how did we get here? I don't think you want to hear the driver of your car say that, but I turned around and sure enough, I had to live up to my reputation. I drove past it going the other way. So my contact with my kids, I mean, I really did love my kids and I would try really hard to be present, but I was so in my head so much of the time. It, it, it was hard for me to stay present for very long periods of time. I also did a lot of thinking that made me anxious. Some people would say I was a full-fledged worrier. Uh, and so I worried about my kids a lot, and I brought that worry to them <clears throat> so that before I knew it, I was passing on that habit of thinking to my kids. And then I thought that my kids affected my feelings directly. So I felt at times they were really bothering me, especially since I had so much important work to be thinking about. Um, 
And uh, so I would get annoyed, bothered, frustrated, impatient, uh, and at times uh, just flat out angry with my kids. Uh, so that's, that's where I was before I, I met somebody that just completely changed my life and my parenting changed. I changed quickly and immediately then my parenting changed. <clears throat> I mean, thank you for sharing the sort of the before story. I, I imagine you know, I, I can certainly resonate with um, uh, a lot of <laughs> <laughs> what you shared as, as some my state of being some of the time. And I imagine many dads listening to this will go, oh yeah, that's, that's me too, right? So kind of full and preoccupied, loving yeah. our children, wanting to make an impact, but actually looking in completely the opposite direction for how to get there yeah. than, than where we should be looking. So um, yeah, I'd love, sense, to hear, I'd love to hear that sort of that experience of change that you had and, and, and the impact it had on you. Uh, well, because I read so many books, I was constantly in bookstores. You know, and some people would probably say that was my addiction. <laughs> One time, my daughter and wife, we were walking through town. We were coming up to the bookstore. And before I knew it, they had grabbed both of my arms and were wrapped around them, holding me tight to walk me past the bookstore. And later on, when they were preoccupied in a store, I made my escape and ran back to the bookstore, <laughs> bought a couple more books. Um, one of the books I bought was written uh, by Dr. Roger Mills, who was someone who got interested in community psychology, and he had come across a man named Sidney Banks, and he he had the fortune to meet Sid Banks and hear him talk, and he got deeply affected, and so it changed his work, and uh, he went into one of the most violent uh, communities in the United States. Uh, in a housing project that was run by six gangs and it was the head of the drug distribution in Florida. Very rough neighborhood, H horrible statistics. And he went in there uh, and turned that neighborhood around. So I was just, I was curious about what he learned. And so I'm reading this book and I, I, I finally called up his center in Florida and said, uh, do you do trainings? And so I went down for a five-day training and I got really affected by the training and they said that everything they were sharing is what they had heard a man, this man named Sidney Banks learn. Like, well, who is this Sidney Banks? Who is this? Who is this guy? And he says, well, he, he's a, guy from Scotland and he he was uh grew up very poor and in, in, in a very difficult had a very difficult family life he had to leave school at the end of ninth grade because he was so poor um he was a welder in a pulp factory pulp mill in Canada he had moved to Canada and then he had a cup, uh, uh, one massive insight that the sole source of psychological experience of all of our feelings is thought. And very few people know that. Very few people. I've traveled all over the world and asked people, what are you feeling? And where do you think it comes from? And no matter what people are feeling, because there's no judgment on that, we all have all kinds of feelings, but what makes a huge difference is where you think it comes from. And he realized it's always only created from the power of thought. 
whatever we think. You have an angry thought, you feel angry. You have a sad thought, you feel sad. You have a happy thought, you feel happy. The instant our thinking changes, our feelings change, we can't not feel our thinking. And yet asking people, where do you think your feelings come, come from? No one says thought. No one. It's, it's almost, man, it's almost uncanny. No one says thought. People say, well, I'm angry because of what somebody did. They don't say I'm angry because of I'm thinking angry thoughts. They say I'm angry because of what somebody said to me or did. I'm sad because of something that happened. I'm happy because, oh, the sun came out. I'm happy because uh, my friend came over. Well, you say, well, your friend came over the other day and you were miserable. The sun was out the other day and you were miserable. <laughs> How can those things make us feel? And yet, you ask anybody where they think they're feeling, whatever they're feeling at that moment, where they think it comes from. So people, situations, the past, personality, how I was raised, my parenting, uh, my biochemistry, my DNA, all external factors that we don't have control over. Well, that was his first insight. And then about a week later, he had what most people would describe as a spontaneous enlightenment experience. I'm sure, I'm, I'm sure people listening in have, have heard or read about near-death experiences where people go into this tunnel of light. They have feelings of intense love and compassion and well-being. They feel completely insightful about their life. And then they don't keep going all the way through. They come back. We said, Sid, did you have a near-death experience? He says, no, I went all the way through. It was literally a death experience. And in those moments, it was only a matter of seconds. He came back into the world or came back into his bodily experience. And he said to his wife with tears in his eyes, uh, I've come home. I'm free. I've transcended the boundaries of time, space, and matter. What I've just learned will uh, change the whole field of psychology and psychiatry. You and I will travel the world and I'll share this. He has no idea where those words came from. They just came out of his mouth. Can you imagine this, what his wife would think? Here's this guy who by his own description was very insecure. He had, he had a temper. Uh, he didn't like to read at all. He didn't read any books. He wasn't studying any spiritual, he didn't have any spiritual practice or teachers. And he had this experience. And his was, he said, all human beings think, all human beings are aware, all human beings have a mind. The power of thought is the most powerful thing in the world because it can create every single moment of human feeling and experience. Power of consciousness is such a is such a gift to each of us that allows us to be aware of life and it allows us to be aware of the fact that we're thinkers. This, this is a cool thing. And then uh, he talked about, and we're connect, our mind is far greater than we ever imagined. We're connected to this deeper intelligence. Okay, I go to my first training, and here's what I heard. Let's get this simple, because he discovered these fundamental universal principles, thought, consciousness, and mind. You take away any one of those, you don't have a human being. Together, they create every moment of experience. Here's what I heard. Um, 
deep inside me is perfect well-being already and it only gets covered over by all the thinking that I do all the thinking I get caught up in all the thinking I start thinking is true but whenever I relax everything I'm thinking for no reason I start to feel better and my thinking upgrades <laughs> I, I think I have more common sense. Mm. I think better. I have I, I have better ideas. I have a knowing that's uncanny. I just sort of know what to do and how to be. This was the first time. Here I was. I had been a psychologist for ten years. This is the first time I had heard anybody say, "You have." perfect mental health inside of you already you don't have to develop it you don't have to work on it you don't have to do practices and studies you have to become aware of the fact that it's there it's a space inside all of us underneath all of the thinking we do that's always free it can't be damaged it can't be hurt nothing that happens to you in your life can damage it it's energy our true nature as human beings is energy. Mm. So that was the first thing I heard. Every human being has perfect well-being, but it, that didn't make any sense until I started to realize that was true for me. My whole life I thought I was missing something. I was damaged goods because of how I was raised and you know, growing up in a family with a father who was alcoholic and... Uh, uh, a mother who was lived in fear. Uh, I thought I was damaged goods, and all of a sudden, I'm starting to sense it. And I notice when I just stop searching and trying and efforting and just relax, I felt better for no reason. And and just quickly, and then we can talk about this. The second thing I realized is that. The power of thought is always generate, generating mental activity in me. In other words, every human being is always thinking. And that whatever we think, we feel. So I had to see that for myself. It didn't do any good to think about it or hear somebody say that. The 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 first night I was in the hotel room during my first training in, in the principles, I started thinking about something that was a week away. And the more I thought about it, the more anxious I got. And for the first time in my life, I became aware of the fact that I was thinking up experience. And as soon as I realized I'm sitting here in a hotel room and something is a week away, it hasn't even happened, and I'm thinking, thinking, thinking in such a way as creating my anxiety. Bam. That threw me back into the now. In other words, the instant we let go of all of our thinking, everybody comes back to the now. And it's only in the now we can find our well-being. Only in the now. You can't think your way to well-being. I tried that. I tried that, Matt, for years and years and years. So there was two things I, I, I learned. Uh, I'm thinking up my experience, and I have perfect well-being underneath all that thinking. It's an amazing story, and I haven't heard that from you yet, so I've just been listening with, with a lot of kind of – uh, curiosity and, and awe at that experience, Dickon. And I'm, I'm, I was wondering, how did things play out at home after that? And when, after you had those two insights, what shifted? It, it was dramatic. It blew me away, Matt, to tell you the truth. It, it blew me away. The first thing that happened is when I got upset with my kids, I couldn't blame them for my upset anymore. I, I was catching on to 
that all of my feelings are created from the thinking I'm doing in the moment. Now that made my anger not so scary. It's just my thinking. So what I started to do over and over again, I'd, I'd feel upset or, or tense or anxious or sad or hurt or frustrated. And those feelings became friendly, they were helpful. They would wake me up to the fact that I was a thinker. Because if I really saw in the moment that what I was thinking was creating my feeling, I didn't need anybody to tell me what to do with that thinking. I didn't need any technique. You put your hand on a hot stove, if you know your pain is coming from having your hand on the stove, you don't ask for techniques. So when I would catch myself in the moment thinking up worry or upset or anger or hurt, I would just plain and simple let go of the thinking that was creating those feelings. And it became pretty evident to me that if I stopped thinking about something that was making me feel something, those thoughts would just start to fall away and, and so would the feeling. And what that meant was that if I waited just a little bit, sometimes seconds, sometimes minutes, sometimes I had to wait quite a while, but at some point my head would clear, I'd feel great. And if I went and parented from that good feeling, rather than from my upset, I felt, wow, I don't have to parent the way I was parented. I'm not locked into my history. It has nothing to do with how I was parented or, or my personality or anything. And what started to happen is all during the day, I'd become aware of the fact that I was thinking and I would drop thoughts left and right. I started dropping all kinds of thoughts. Now, if any human being lets go of thoughts that are weighing on them, burdening them, tensing them, they'll start feeling lighter and lighter more present, happier, spend more time in the now rather than caught up in thinking about things, any human being. It, it gave me hope like I couldn't believe. So I started seeing more and more of myself as a thinker. Now, I was so excited about this. I wanted my kids to know it. There were no books. There were no tapes. I was just flying by the seat of my pants. <laughs> I'd see my kids upset, and I'd run up to them while they were upset, and I'd say, Nina, Ben, it's just thought. That's all it is. It's, it's not a problem. There's nothing wrong with feeling what you're feeling, but it's thought. You have to recognize that, and then you can let it go, and da 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 da, da. Well, I didn't know that if you try to teach anybody while they're upset, your chances of being successful are nil. So they put up with it for two weeks. And at the end of two weeks, my daughter and son approached me together. And my daughter was like the union rep. And she was dead. And I've been talking. <laughs> I said, oh boy. I said, we've decided. If you say one more word about thought or moods, we're going to run away. <laughs> and I said, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to turn you guys off to this. And then it just popped out of my mouth. I promise you, I won't say a word about this unless you ask me. Now, for me as a parent, this was good. I couldn't, I could no longer try to fix my kids before I was fixed myself. I could no longer be the expert and authority that was going to get them to change. I was too invested in them changing. It wasn't clean. So for six months, I just lived this, man. I just lived with this understanding. I'm not recommending this. It's just what occurred to me. It's what was helpful to me. I didn't want to be the psychologist that drove his kids crazy. Right? But here's what happened. By recognizing that I had this well-being and all I had to do is uncover it 
And it's only in the now that that well-being will come through. I started catching myself more and more. I started being grateful that I felt angry and hurt and stressed and upset because it was like an alarm clock going off to wake me up to the now. To literally not let go of some of my thinking, not let go of my upset thinking and start analyzing and trying to figure out what to do, but to literally let go of everything I was thinking, come back to the now and just go about my day. And in no time, or after a period of time, my head would clear. I have enormous clarity and I would, my heart would show. And I just go back and be with my kids in that feeling and bring that feeling to them. And then I found out when I'm in that feeling, when I'm in the heart feeling, I can say anything to my kids and it works out great. It's coming from the right place. It's not coming from my annoyance, my bother, my upset. So here's an early example. Can I give an example now? Yeah, please do. Yeah. Right? I, I think people can relate to this. Uh, my son was nine years old. He would get home from school and he'd come in the front door and he'd always just throw his stuff everywhere. I mean, he had more stuff than any, I don't know, it's just his shoes and his coats and, 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 and his backpack and, his, and stuff he had just everywhere. And I, I talked to him, you know, very calmly. Would, this is before I learned about this. I, I'd, I'd be annoyed and bothered and talk to him with a little bit of annoyance saying, Ben, come on. What, what are you doing, man? You're messing up our house. You can't be doing that. You got to clean up it. Yeah, you hear my tone? You hear my tone? <laughs> when I thought about it later, I realized I never liked when people talked to me with that. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, so he would get defensive in the face of that kind of tone. And it would escalate. And sort of like, if he didn't do it the first time, then I, my tone would <laughs> go up. In other words, I'd get more and more upset. I'd get more and more angry. Uh, then I learned, the, I, I learned about thought and well-being. I come home. I see this stuff all over the floor once again. I get really upset, but something was different. I was aware that it was me. I, I was no blame, no judgment. It's just feelings come from thought. It's not good or bad or right or wrong. It's how it works for every human being. It's always worked that way. It always will work that way. So I saw myself upset and I waited just a minute and I let go of all of that upset thinking. And it didn't take long before I felt calm. To me, calm, <laughs> feeling calm was a good indicator I was safe. It was sort of like red light, yellow light, and then green light, okay. Calm is a green light. So I walked in the kitchen, sure enough, there's my nine-year-old with a sandwich about a foot high, and he unhinged his jaw and was about ready to devour this sandwich. And, uh, I knew that if he's in a good place and I'm in a good place, we're going to have a great talk. I was way more interested in him being in a good place. In, in communication, it's called getting rapport with someone. It just means before you do business, make sure you're both in a good place. So I say, hey, Ben, how is soccer today? Because he loves soccer, and I, I love soccer. And... We got talking about soccer, and I could see him just l l lighting up because he's his head is clearing of his thoughts about the day, and then his well-being is coming through. It's like the clouds part, the sun comes out. And then I say, so Ben, I, I saw all your stuff going from the front door to the kitchen again. Uh, and I was thinking about it, and I, and I think I've probably talked to you about this about 300 times. Now, you hear my tone? It's very different than, Ben, hey, what is this? It was, 
So Ben, I, I think it's probably been about 300 times. He didn't miss a beat. Humor, he matched humor with humor. He goes, Dad, you, your counter must be broken, man. I'd been counting too. It's, it's 312 times today, the truth. <laughs> we both are laughing. You know why? Because the feeling, I didn't realize in parenting how important the feeling is that we bring to our kids or to our spouse or to the people, our friends or people we work with. Now, don't get me wrong. I have all the feelings anybody else have. I get angry. I get upset. I get pissed. I get this. I get that. To recognize it's your own thinking allows us to take responsibility for our own thinking. If we have a cold, we take responsibility for the fact we have a cold, and we don't think it's a good idea to walk up and sneeze in their face. We take responsibility for our sneezing, and it's not hard to do that, right? Well, I started taking responsibility for what feelings I was sneezing on my kids, and I just started thinking it's not a good idea if it's my own thinking to dump it on them. And I didn't see it working. And it didn't work with my father and I. I didn't like it at all, the stuff he did with me about that way. So we're, we're joking around. And, I, and then the other thing is, part of our well-being is that we get new thinking that's fresh, creative, responsive, wise. And it just popped out of my mouth. I said, you know, Ben, and I've never said this to my son before. I've tried everything I can think of and nothing seems to make a difference for you putting your stuff away. What do you think we should do? I'm stumped. I'm completely stumped. I have no idea. What do you think? See, that's a new idea for me. That's a new thought. That's a outside my conditioning thought. That's a, that I never heard that from my dad. You know, I don't know what I'm doing. What do you think? And my son said, well, Dad, it's simple. I said, every one of my friends, when you come in their front door or back door, they have hooks where you can hang your stuff. We have this old house. We don't have a back door mudroom like all my friends. And there are no hooks in the front. And I go, oh, my God, Ben, we, we've been going full bore over this forever. Are you telling me that if we went to the store and got you some hooks, that would do it? That would do it? That would solve this problem? He goes, yeah. I said, okay, finish your sandwich. We're going to the store. We get to the hardware store and he picks out these wooden peg hooks and I go, oh, Ben, they're so ugly. He says, dad, those are the ones my friends have. I thought you said, <laughs> I said, okay, okay, I'll put up with those ugly hooks if this works. We go home, I said, get the drill. Zzz, zzz, and we put, I asked him where he thought it would be best to put it up. We put it up. See, he's, we're now collaborators. We're now two people in their health looking for new thinking and creative ideas and solutions rather than me being the tyrant saying my way or the highway and I'm only sticking with one and I fell in love with parenting. All I have to do to be a good parent is pay attention to my feelings wake up to the fact of thought, keep coming back to the now, and when I'm in good feeling, then talk. Then think about what to do. Don't be trying to analyze it when I, when I learn not to analyze what just keep me upset. In other words, no human being can analyze their way to well-being. It's only when our head clears that we discover well-being. I used to try and figure out how to do stuff so that I could feel better rather than feel better first so I could figure out how to do stuff. One was hard and one, one made it fun and creative and new thinking and uh, still challenging, but what a, what a great challenge. 
Matt, what, what a great challenge. I, I stopped feeling like I was parenting from my conditioning. I was free of my past. If I opened my mouth when I was upset, I sounded just like my father when he was upset, and I'd say the same damn things, right? And if I waited until I was in a good feeling and parented, I didn't sound like my dad. It sounded like a healthy dickin. Oh, I can't tell you how good, how empowering as a father that was. I can be a healthy father, no matter what my past was. Yeah, I mean, I think such such an amazing story, and um, uh, you've answered so many of the questions I had for you in in just the kind of the few anecdotes you you shared today. One thing that, I, that that's coming back to me like listening to you, I think you know everything you shared. I think will resonate enormously with the dads who are listening, and 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 offer an enormous amount of hope as well um, around people who are struggling with the relation, their relationships with their, their children or their, their partners. One thing I've been exploring with other dads is kind of the enormous pressure that they feel to be a certain way. And I think you've, you've kind of been alluding to that throughout what you shared. But what I'm, what I'm sh- thinking about, about when I say that is like um, the pressure they might feel to be a, a breadwinner in the family, a pressure to feel a leader in the family, um, a, a pressure to feel um, that they should parent in a certain way. And I think you've spoken to some of those things, but I'm just wondering if you could sort of give us some insights about um, what could help dads who who live in, in that feeling of pressure all the time to be a certain way. Oh, I totally understand that because I was the sole breadwinner for a long time in our family. Um when my wife was unable to work. Um, Now, what I learned that is actually scientific is that feelings don't come from the outside world. Situations don't somehow magically create feelings in human beings. So pressure is an ordinary human feeling that I think everybody at some point will feel, but consider that it's created from how we're thinking about our situation, not from what other people are demanding of us, not what our finances are. I mean, I know people who have no money who live with no pressure, and I know people with millions. I've worked with top executives in companies all over the U.S., lots of top executives. Oh, man, you want to see pressure. And they've got beautiful families. They've got all kinds of money. They've got it. And they were thrilled to learn that their pressure and their stress is thought in the moment and that the awareness of that would bring people back into the now free of the thinking people had been doing and had gotten so acclimated to, they didn't even realize they were constantly thinking. And that when people are in the now, always met, what we're thinking begins to fall away. I I use the metaphor of a snow globe. If you're thinking about stuff, you're still shaking the globe. When you're in the now, you put the snow globe down and you don't have to worry about clearing your head or getting rid of your thinking or thinking positive. Thinking positive is shaking the jar too. It's just putting it down and in the now, when we rest in the now, whatever we're thinking will fall away. And it's, a, it's true of every human being I've ever met. When people's thinking falls away, they feel better. Now, because people don't know that that well-being is innate, it's in us, it's inborn, it's our natural state, people, when they feel good, misattribute that, and they think that comes from the outside. So that used to complicate my my life with my kids, 
as a parent or with my wife because I, I thought I needed them to be a certain way so that I could feel good. Because I would notice when they were all well behaved and doing well, I appeared to be happy. So I assumed it was because of them. So I became, I became more negative, more demanding, more trying to get them to be different from my own insecurities so that I could feel better. Would you stop making noise so I can feel better? Right? And after I learned this, when I wasn't feeling good, I knew that if I was woke up to the now and rested there, guaranteed, maybe even just a little bit better, man. But the difference from parenting from full-blown upset to a little bit better, that alone makes a big difference. Mm. And your kids will tell you. Yeah, yeah. After six months, my, my kids came up to me and said, Dad, you and, you and Mom are different from any of the parents of my friends. And I say, how so? And they say, oh, man, they get upset with them constantly. They're all over them. You guys don't do that with us. You know, <laughs> that wasn't true six months earlier. But in six months' time, everybody in our family started becoming healthier. My kids weren't living in an environment where they were afraid that at any minute dad was going to lose it. You see, that made a big difference. Yeah. They started to relax. We started having conversations when when both of us were in good moods we could talk about anything we'd have unbelievable conversations conversations like that that i never could remember having with my parents where we were just sitting around talking about anything i i can say to I, one time i got so upset with my daughter she had just hit high school age she had done something i was so upset and I waited, and I was so upset. I had to wait a little bit for this. I, I'm not avoiding talking to her. I'm waiting until I'm at my best. And I found out that one talk when I'm at my best is worth 50 when we're both upset, maybe 100. So I didn't mind waiting a little bit. And, and finally, I calmed down, and I went to my daughter, and I said, Nina, I'd like to talk to you about what happened the other day. Now, she could already tell by my feeling, by my tone, that I was safe. Kids can tell. If you have a tone, you're not safe to them, and their defenses will go up. You can tell I was safe. So she said, sure, I'll be glad to talk about it. And I was surprised by what came out of my mouth, but it came with a feeling. So the words weren't important. I said, Nina, what you did the other day, I thought was the stupidest thing I've ever seen you do. And she laughed and she said, Dad, you're kidding. What, I'm 15? You're saying this is the stupidest thing you've seen me do in 15 years? And I said, yeah, I think so. She goes, why? We had the best talk. There was no fight there was no i'm not blaming now this came after six months of bringing good feeling to her so she started to trust that she could say anything to me and we could have a good talk and if i got upset i'd say well we can talk about this again later and i'd stop the talk because i didn't want to sneeze on her or <laughs> to be even more graphic there were times when i'd throw up on my kids mm -hmm. you know yeah you know, this was so upset and never once did my kids stop and go, oh, thank you, Dad. That's really helpful. I've learned my lesson. I'll, I'll, I'll be different. <laughs> it usually backfired and pretty soon they'd be doing that with each other. And then pretty soon it's, as they got older, it started coming back toward me. And boy, you could see how that could escalate. No one was taking responsibility for feelings, innocently. Innocent. Yeah. yeah. Oh, can I, can I say something else, too? Mm. There were times when I needed to parent, but I was really upset. 
And, it, and it's not, I'm not stupid. I'm not going to say, well, I got to wait a day until I'm calm before I can keep my kid from running across the street. But if there's an old saying in psychology, if you know you're crazy, you're not. So I'm not blaming them for my upset, but because I could take responsibility for it, if I got upset with my kids, I could go back and say, listen, I'm really sorry. See, I'd never done that as a parent before. My, parent, my parents never said they were sorry for anything they did. I say, I'm really sorry. I was upset and I, and I reacted and I, I don't really think that's a good idea, but that's, the, that's as good as I could do at that moment. And if it was an exception rather than the rule, the kids would be very, very forgiving. They say, well, dad, you know, that happens, big, no big deal. We, we know you didn't mean it. Now, the other thing when I'm really upset is I'll do, I, I came up with this phrase, if I'm really upset, I just want to minimize the damage. You know, I want to sneeze into my elbow, right? If I get upset, it's fine. I don't care that I'm upset or stressed. When I, when I understand where it's coming from, I can take responsibility for it and know it's, it's best to keep my mouth shut as best I can, to say as little as I can. If it's something really important, I can always come back to it later and have a good talk about it, like bedtime not going well and I'm pissed. Maybe that night is not the best time to try and have a talk with your kid about changing things. And then wait until the next night and just before bed saying, listen, bedtime hasn't been going so great. What do you, th what's going on? And really listen. And what do you think we can do about it? And what about this? And what about that? And you're back to being collaborators and creative together. And I am amazed most of the time the solutions to these problems came from my kids if if I asked for their common sense when they were in a really good place. Mm -hmm. And once they got used to this idea of sort of brainstorming, it, it took a, a, a little bit. I, I just had to be patient, but it was way more fun than what I was doing before. And at least we were having talks and at least we were having good mood talks rather than low mood talks. You could, you could make the case that every single fight and argument and conflict in a family is when two people in a low mood think it's a good idea to try and talk about things. Every fight that happens in relationships. So in a, in a sense, I resigned doing low mood talks. I told my family, I'm not doing them anymore. It's too painful for me. I don't like how I am when I do that. And they they would try to get me draw me back in <laughs> but they couldn't once i once i knew how this worked i could mm -hmm. it's like someone sitting in the back seat of the car saying run the red light and you say no no thank you yeah. there's cars going 60 miles an hour the other way i'm not i'm not running this light they can be screaming and yelling at you i can do it yeah yeah beautiful okay. I had one one sort of last thing to ask you, Dickon, and there's been so much richness in what you've shared. But I remember a really powerful conversation I had with you around the idea of personal freedom, and I've been exploring that with other dads too. This idea that somehow kids and personal freedom are incompatible. And I remember you saying to me, because uh, I remember we were talking about bedtimes, you know, which has been a bit of a theme in our work. Um, and uh, I was saying to you, well, you know, I get really cross because this, you know these bedtimes drag on and on, and and then I feel my time isn't you know, isn't my own, and I don't get you know, to have that time that I was expecting. And uh, and you told a great story, which I don't think there's it may not be time for, but um, but I remember you saying that actually, uh, when you dropped the idea that freedom, your personal freedom, was something separate. From time with your children something shifted massively for you and i wonder if you just could speak to that for a couple of minutes before we finish 
it's worth the story. I'll tell it fast. Because stories are a good way. It's, it's the best way I learned. It's a good way of learning things like this. Uh, we, I was doing bedtimes with my son. Uh, I'd be putting him to bed. And every time he'd get into bed, he, he had ADD, or he was diagnosed with that. That's another whole story. But he would be wound up and going 90 miles an hour, and he would stay that way until he just suddenly just sort of passed out. And there was no downtime. And so I'd put him in bed, and he's going 9,000 miles an hour, and I'm going, oh, man, it's already late. Uh, you know, this is eating into my time in the evening. I'm getting more and more aggravated. And sure enough, he'd start begging for food or begging for water. Or I have to go to the bathroom. And time and time again, I'd be laying on his bed and he'd be downstairs and I'd fall asleep on his bed waiting for him to come back, getting more and more pissed. And bedtimes were a nightmare. They were just, I'm, I would get angry at five o'clock at night just thinking about bedtime. Now, I learned these principles for me, they were a lifesaver. All human beings think, all human beings are aware, all human beings have this capacity for well-being built into them. And I saw my irritation, my annoyance, my bother, my thinking, this isn't fair, I'm not getting my time. Those are thoughts, those are ideas, those are beliefs. Now, I have one of two choices when I become aware of that. Hold on to them and keep suffering. Or let go of them and see what new and fresh comes in their place. And I can tell you, new and fresh is always waiting to come in, but we have to let go of the old. So a couple of nights went by when I'm laying on his bed and I'm just relaxing and letting go of thought rather than getting more and more worked up. Well, that was an improvement, even though nothing changed, but now I'm not so crazy and, and so miserable. And sure enough, when any human being, when their head starts to really calm down and get clear, they start getting totally new outside the box thinking. And a new thought occurred to me, which hadn't been true. I'm not having fun with my son when I put him to bed. Forget him. I need to have fun. I need to make this fun for me. <laughs> my son comes into the bedroom. It's, it's time for bed. And I say, Ben, I have this idea. When I was a kid, I used to love to play waste paper basketball. And you crumple up paper and you try to shoot it. And I taught him how to play that. And I said, well, there's some rules. You stay on your bed. I'll, I'll get them each time. And I'm calming down while we're playing. I'm in a nice feeling. Pretty soon we're laughing. Now, you have to understand, we hadn't laughed together at bedtime for months. It was serious business. And we knew it was going to escalate into horrible feelings. So he'd want to get out of the room and get into bed and close his damn eyes. <laughs> So we're having fun. Now, when kids are in really good moods, like any human being, they're more cooperative, friendlier, more thoughtful, more respectful. They want to help. So we're having fun. We play this game for quite a while. And then I say, okay, Ben, it's time for bed. You want me to read? And he goes, no, that's okay, Dad. I'll just go to sleep. I'm, and I'm going, who is this kid? Who... <laughs> It is like the aliens came in and replaced my son. Uh, it's a plain and simple fact. You know how they say you catch more flies with honey? Or love draws people toward you. Hatred, dislike, upset, pushes people away. Well, when I... Gonna sound funny for dads. You forget about your kids and what they're doing and take full responsibility for your own state of mind. And when I started doing that, so many things that I thought were encroaching on my freedom. You know what was encroaching on my freedom? 
all the thoughts I was doing all the time that were just weighing on me and getting me more and more upset, making me feel more a prisoner, making me dislike being a parent. And that when true freedom is discovering this space inside of you, that's always free of that thinking, always free. And any human being touches that space, you'll feel at home. I wrote a book called Coming Home. You feel like you've come home, you're comfortable, you're relaxed, you're open, and you're enjoying whatever you're doing in the moment. That's freedom. <laughs> it's an inner freedom, <laughs> not an external freedom. Yeah. So. That's a, and a wonderful story, and, and you've perfectly got it in time. This has been such a, a rich uh, experience, Dick, and I think people listening are going to get, get a ton of it. Where, where can we find out more about you if people want to look you up? Um, I have a website. Um, I, I'm not, I just want to let people know I'm at the point in my career where um, I'm not taking any individual clients um, because I do a lot of training and seminars and webinars and, and I'm really putting my focus into that. Uh, People can look at my website, though. It, it's up and has lots of things on it and videos. Or uh, it's the number three, principlesmentoring.com. Principles Mentoring. we, we just lost your microphone. I'm thinking for a second there. I can't hear you. There is that. Oh, there, you, there, I got you again. Yeah, do you want, mind just saying that last bit again? Yeah, okay. Uh, to tell you the truth, if you Google my name on YouTube, you'll find three yeah. pages of my talks, if not more. I mean, it's crazy. I'm, everywhere I go, it's, there's a camera now. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's, uh, so that's a good resource. Yeah. Um, I would second that. Uh, there's a website, 3pgc.org, that has tons of free stuff. That's a, it's a great resource. It's, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a group that when Sid Banks died, a number of us that were closest to him put together to make available this teaching uh, in the way that he shared it as, as best we can you know, keeping true to the three principles. Mm. So those are, those are great resources. Fantastic. Thank you so much for your time. It's been a beautiful conversation. Oh, Matt, you're welcome, man. Great talking to you. Yeah. Being a parent is, and grandparent now is, is the best part of my life. Mm. Best part of my life. Beautiful. It really comes through. All righty. 